Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the uh, second part of our Collaborate series of webinars. So this is um, getting started with Caseware Collaborate. Um, so Phil Reeves is going to be taking you through uh, some more parts of Caseware Cloud. Don't worry if you missed the first part of this series. We did record that session and that is available on our YouTube channel and on the Knowledge Base. We'll signpost those a bit later on. Uh, but as you can see there, Phil Reeves, Education and Media Consultant, is going to be taking you through the content today. My name's Tom Jeffrey. I'm one of the Education and Media Technicians at Caseware UK. I'll be uh, moderating, if you like, the session today. So uh, I'll be making sure everything runs smoothly, but also I'll be monitoring your questions as they come in. Talking of questions, you can use the Zoom control panel to submit those. Use the Q&A feature there and we'll answer the question as soon as we can. I'll see if I can put it to fill during the session. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Any questions that we don't answer live, we'll get back to you directly afterwards, but we'll also include those in a Q&A document, which will upload to the knowledge base with the recording of the session. Uh, you've got the chat feature there, which is really more about um, if you're experiencing any technical issues or if we send anything your way during the session, just keep an eye there, but use the Q&A option for your questions, please. Uh, so that's uh, take, just taken us through the housekeeping there. I'll hand over to Phil and we'll get started, first of all, with the agenda. Yes, thank you, Tom. Thank you for today. Uh, as Tom has already said, thank you for attending today's webinar, um, Collaborate Part 2. Um, just as, uh, or you can see the agenda on the screen. So we're going to be starting just with a recap of some of the elements we covered in part one, I'm not going to go through them in ridiculous detail because obviously there's another webinar for that. Um, but just so you've got an idea of what we've already covered, if you didn't attend the first uh, uh, webinar, we would then be looking at staff entities and as you can see settings and roles and the links between those elements. Um, this is very much looking at some of the more administrative elements of the caseware cloud. Um, obviously will be relevant to everyone. You need to know why you can't access certain areas or how you can ensure that other users can access certain areas, depending on what kind of uh, access level that you've got uh, within the Caseware cloud. Um, so for example, if you're uh, the admin, um, then you'll need to know how to set up staff with the right access rights, how to group them together if you wanna be able to control the entities that they can access. Um, if we're looking at the settings element, um, so the roles will be looking at more security based settings we will be dipping in and out of the settings screen. But again, as Tom said, if anyone's got any questions as we go through, then please feel free to drop them into the chat function. And Tom, uh, as you said, please feel free to jump in at any point and ask any questions that you've got. Um, the other thing, if there are specific areas of the cloud that you guys think actually it'd be worth us covering this in a bit more detail, please add that into the chat. Um, or alternatively, um, if there's areas that you want us to cover in our part three, then please feel free to uh, also add that into the chat function if you want to. So yeah, just as a quick recap of part one, I'm going to jump straight into the Caseware Cloud. Um, so during part one, we were looking specifically at things like searches and contacts and navigation within the Caseware Cloud. Um, the navigation itself, as we mentioned, we're going to be going a lot into these three lines button on the left hand side. Uh, the menu icon will allow us to access different applications. Uh, our templates within the Caseware Cloud can be accessed from here. Um, we can access pretty much any area of the Caseware Cloud from this three lines button. So our activities, the entities themselves, we can go through and we're going to see that we can access our staff from here as, as and when we go through and we look at those areas. Um, we mentioned obviously the, the use of this engagement section, uh, which is a very useful tool for us to be able to uh, view the areas of, of the file, what make up uh, our, um, or what we have access to. So what we're preparing, what we're reviewing within the Caseware Cloud, what work is outstanding. We can see all of that across all of the different uh, engagement types. So whether it's, uh, if we're looking at the SE templates, uh, if we're doing audits, tax accounts, the engagement screen will allow us to, to apply those different um, filters and also to view those uh, areas that we're preparing and reviewing and, and make sure that we can streamline how much work we've got remaining on each of those different areas and um, so if i go into engagement on mine you can see i've got one file and if i select that i can see on here any outstanding documents those have been prepared 
who's it, who it has been assigned to. So I would only see those that are specific to me as a user. Um, but again, more details on that are, are available within our first part of this webinar series. But again, if anyone's got any questions specifically as a result of that, please feel free to chuck them into our chat feature. Now, on the, uh, if I just come out this screen, obviously on the, the left hand side, I've mentioned the quick search. Um, this is a specific, oh, this is quite important. Again, when we're looking for, if we want to look for certain entities uh, or people, we can search. So if I type in ABC, you can see it comes up with entities and people that are associated with those specific entities. Um, when we're going through and we're looking at entities themselves, we can add contacts into those entities as we saw. Um, but firstly, if we're looking at the people, these are this is pointing to staff and contacts that have access to these entities that I've typed in. So because I've typed in ABC Motor Company, <clears throat> it's going to show me the two entities and myself uh, and, and my colleague James who have access to these entities um, within the case where Cloudora have been set up as, as contacts within those entities, you'll be able to see that. And we'll also be able to see staff uh, or from a staff perspective, We'll also be able to see staff that have been assigned to that. Now, the first thing, obviously, when you're creating and accessing the case where uh, cloud from a, from an admin point of view, um, you need to make sure that all of your staff are set up after you obviously you've got the appropriate licenses. And to set up your staff, you can go to the free lines button and scroll down and we've got the option for staff here. So it'll always be available. Um, how much people can do within the staff section will depend entirely on their access rights. So we're going to be looking at roles and, and um, security settings available within the case where cloud during this session as well. Um, but if I go to staff here, you can see I'll get a list as the um, as one of the, the admins within this uh, cloud server, I will have the option to add new staff in. Um, when you first create or when, when the admin initial admin first accesses the Caseway Cloud. There'll only be one user and that'll be themselves. So when the initial Caseway Cloud is set up and uh, by the My Caseware portal, again, if you're unsure of that, please feel free to let us know and we can send some details over. Um, but when that initial My Caseware portal is set up and you put your information in with your email address and you, you get sent your firm specific URL, um, Caseware uh, will set up you as the first user of the Caseware cloud. And from there, you'll be in charge of, and be set up automatically as the admin to be able to go through and add other staff and other uh, entities and, and contacts potentially into the Caseware cloud. Um, So if we go to, uh, if we want to add new staff in, we can go to the new option here and we can add staff manually one at a time, or we can import staff directly into the Caseware cloud. So by, by manually adding the staff, it gives us a little bit more, uh, a wider control in terms of setting up individual users with individual access rights, uh, importing sort of clumps everyone together into a certain group or a certain uh, access level. And um, if I go to add staff, just to give you an idea of how to add the individual staff, uh, the first thing you need to be aware of is that you've got a certain amount of cloud licenses remaining. So if this appears as zero, it means that you've got, you've used up all your existing cloud licenses. The question mark icon on the right hand side will indicate that we've got uh, certain numbers of uh, licenses remaining for, uh, or well, sorry, we'll give us an overview of how many we've purchased, how many are active at the moment, and how many are remaining also renewal date and give us a direct link to that go uh, to my or to my case where where you can purchase additional licenses if you need to and this is also where you would go if you need to edit staff um, so we're adding staff at the moment but I can click on an existing staff member and I can edit them so again if we're changing over licenses uh, then we can do that as and when we're going um, through by the pen icon on the right hand side when we're adding new staff members uh, there are some required fields so we need to provide a, an email address a first name and a last name. Um, that is the minimum that is required for you when you're setting up new members of staff within the Caseware Cloud. Um, again, for this instance, we're going to say, we'll go Rebecca um, R field for today. Um, and we'll go at caseware.co.uk. 
So obviously to keep it consistent, as we are uh, obviously a case where first name will go Rebecca and then we'll surname our field. Now you can see, obviously I've just typed it in. There are other pieces of information that you can include, job titles, positions, uh, the purpose of including, if you do choose to include this information, like position, again, is very much for filtering the staff and also allows you to quickly group the staff together uh, if you were to need or if you needed to um, at any point. So if I just wanted to see those that are set up as partners, I'd be able to use the filter icon that is available behind this screen. I'll show you in a minute uh, to filter the staff specifically. Um, so again, in this case, I'm just going to set it up. We'll, we'll say that Rebecca is a, is a partner of this firm. Um, when we get some of the other options, password, we can set that directly by the user or we can auto-generate one. Um, so by default, the password obviously going to want to be set by the user themselves. Um, if we auto-generate one, you can see that password will get sent with a URL to the user. Um, or we can set a password for that particular user, obviously with a default being that the user has to change the password the next time they sign in. Um, so this is specifically useful. Obviously, we all have that moment where we forget our password. And so someone can set it for us if we want to, and obviously change it to something more appropriate as and when we access the Caseware Cloud. Uh, Tom will know that I am uh, a sucker for forgetting my password. Uh, in terms of groups, so we're going to look specifically at groups and setting up groups in a moment. but. We can assign this specific staff member to a group that has already exists within the Caseware Cloud. So we've got three, or sorry, four groups, three offices and the Caseware staff group. Um, now the benefit of setting up groups and assigning specific staff members to groups uh, is that we can then control which files they have access to. So for example, uh, in this case, our Edinburgh office might be looking more specifically at charity and academy files. Um, or it may be that they look at obviously their own clientele and their own certain client files. So we want to make sure that they can only access those certain files. So when we're setting up entities and we're setting up staff, we can assign them to these specific uh, groups, which will obviously, uh, the benefit of that is that we can control what they can see and how much they can do at each level um, or in each uh, area of caseware. So the groups don't necessarily have to be offices. They could be based on those um, uh, job titles or job positions I mentioned. So we're a partner, we could have a partners group if we wanted to, which gives them slightly more access level than some of the other uh, positions. Um, System-wide roles, again, these, as we work down through admin, settings admin, staff admin, entity admin, owner, editor, viewer, and entity access, each of those different levels provide slightly less access rights uh, within the case where cloud. So for example, uh, your admin, will be able to uh, control pretty much anything on the Caseware Cloud. Um, so that will be like your top level, generally your IT guys um, or, or a super user at the firm uh, will have admin rights. Setting admin rights will allow them to change some of the settings. Uh, staff admin will allow a user to add certain staff members in. Um, again, if I uh, hover over this, you can see it does give us a quick overview of what that does. So staff admin can add, view, edit, and delete all staff in the system. Uh, entities is pretty much the same, but for entities, um, but if I had entities admin, but I didn't have staff admin, I wouldn't be able to control any of the information within the staff themselves or the staff section, but I would be able to control information within the entity section. So again, just something to be aware of, you need to make sure that, uh, again, you can go through and set up uh, these roles individually for each member of staff, or you can do it as part of that wider group. Um, applications, again, you can control the applications that the staff has member has access to individually. So I can go, actually, I want them to have access to uh, corporation, um, or sorry, company's house and missions, or I want them to have access to um, the UK company audit uh, exemption Mercia template. Again, you have different licenses, or in some instances, you have licenses that uh, are available for each of these templates. You'll also see that in some instances, the apps are inherited from the assigned groups. So when you set up a member of staff by default, uh, some of these applications will already be available because of the way that or each staff member is automatically given access to example to the uh, UK company audit uh, Mercia template or the UK company audit hat template uh, because of the fact that obviously they're working on that specific element of the Caseware cloud. And um, again, you can obviously change 
depending on the groups, but we'll come back to setting up groups in a, in a moment. Standard hours wouldn't tend to touch at this point, but what we will do is just go through. And if I jump back into general, um, make sure I've got all the information I need. Uh, just set by the user and then we'll save that. So that member of staff will then be available within the staff lists on the, the staff screen, as we can see. Um, right at the top of the screen, nice and easy for us to view. Again, if I ever need to go for an edit this, so for example, say our, our Rebecca um, uh, staff member leaves, I can always go into the edit function and I can assign this to a different user. So I can change uh, the email address, change the first name and, and last name and the initials to, to another user, say you know, Ben Collins, for example, um, and then we could apply that particular license over to Ben. Um, you'll see at the top on the right hand side, our li a cloud licenses remaining is now down to uh, just to two members of staff. Um, so you can do it individually, or if we go into the uh, other option of importing the staff, we can go to new and we can import staff directly into the cloud as well. Now, again, we'll get a pop up to say we've only got two licenses remaining. So we need to make sure that we're within the realms of the number of licenses that we've got left. And that question mark is the same as what we saw earlier. Um, in terms of settings, uh, we can update existing staff information. So if we are importing staff, uh, if we need to import an entire staff list and we're including staff that are already within the Caseware cloud, we have the option to update the existing staff information could be for things like um, changes of names. We can deactivate staff that have, are not listed in the current import. So again, if we're importing a whole new staff list and we're completely replacing the existing list of staff that we've got within the Caseware cloud, we may want to deactivate those that aren't uh, or that are no longer in uh, the, or with the company, um, obviously to, to free up some of the licenses. Uh, does our document contain a header? Uh, well, it could do. Um, and then we need to import it as a CSV. So obviously if you're in Excel, make sure you save it as a CSV. Um, if I import this as, so we're importing some staff. Uh, if I right click open that just quickly with Excel, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, you can see that it's pretty, we've got quite a basic list. We need email addresses, first names and last names. Uh, that's the minimum that's required for that import. So very similar to when we add the staff in manually, those three fields are required, but you can have other information in there, job titles, initials, uh, things like that if you need it. Uh, but when we select that, you can see it comes through in a, in a, a text format. When we click next, you can see we can go through and allocate uh, each of the columns into the correct area within the import screen. So email address, well, so email, first name, uh, last name. You'll see that I didn't change the job title. So if you've got a name that directly matches the default name within Caseware. So for example, uh, we had job title uh, as the name of our column, and that's the name of a standard column uh, within this dropdown. Caseware will automatically allocate that. Uh, we can also import staff groups. So when we're doing that, if you put within your Excel file, the group that you want them to assign to, then you can also import that information. And then we just click import to import that. Um, obviously, I'm aware we've only got two licenses left, so I'm going to cancel this on our particular server. Now, as I say, when it comes through to setting these, these users up, we can go through and we can apply um, elements such as, as roles to these users. Now, the roles that you have available, if we go onto the free lines button, and go to the settings. Uh, we can go to security and we have the option here for role permissions. Now, again, whether you have access to this area or not will depend entirely on your cloud. Uh, again, what role you've been set up with. So as an admin, you'll have access to it all the time. Settings admin will also be able to see it. Um, but for example, entities admin wouldn't be able to, to make any changes within the security settings on the Caseware cloud. So if I go to uh, role permissions, you can see all the different roles that are set up. Now, again, if I select any of them, you can see over here, if I go to show permissions for admin, um, it will show me all the different permissions, uh, which is exactly the same for an admin because I have access to everything, that they have the ability or, or the access rights that that particular admin has. So for example, on contacts, we have the C represents that this user can create contacts. The D means that they can delete it. 
uh, details. So for R, again, they can view detailed contact information. Now, as I go down this list, you're going to see, here we go, so settings admin, slightly less. Staff admin, as you go down, have slightly different access levels. Now, for example, it might be, um, be that actually you want a member of staff to have some elements of settings admin, but also some elements of entity admin, but not all of the admin rights that you'd get from the admin. Um, so, for example, if we go to settings admin, you can see that they can um, read all the settings within organizations for contacts. They can tag staff. Um, the entity itself would be able to uh, create and delete contacts. So we might want a member of staff that can do both of those things, but we don't want to make them a full admin. So what we have the option to do as well is add our own roles into this section. So we can go to add roles and give it a name. So I'm going to call this my um, uh, contact admin, uh, just an example. Oh, sorry, we'll call it contact and staff admin. Give it a description if you want to. Who does it apply to? So we can have um, the ones that highlight in yellow, if I look on the left-hand side, where my mouse cursor is at the moment, you can have uh, different access rights and different um, roles for members of, uh, or contacts, sorry, as well, as members of staff. So we, we saw briefly within the first webinar within this series that when we add a contact in, we can choose whether they are an entity collaborator or they have entity access. So again, we can control access rights for those users uh, if we, or, or add new roles for contacts if we need to. Um, we can apply this to staff, we can do it system-wide, we can do it with content within entities, or we can do it system-wide or content within entities. You can see that the scope of the majority of these, so admin, settings admin, staff admin, and entity admins are all system-wide, so they affect the entire case where cloud. Uh, the owners, editors, viewers, and uh, entity access are more based within the entities themselves, but it's still system-wide because we're looking at all of the entities within that system. Um, so system-wide, I go to next. And then I can go through and control the access rights that this particular user has. So I can say, okay, I want them to be able to create. Um, I may not necessarily want them to be able to delete, or we could want them to delete. Uh, do we want to see detailed? Yeah, we can do. Um, do we want them to be able to control the groups? Or maybe not. Might want them just to be able to, to add the contacts and do the same with, with the staff. We might not want them to be able to delete staff. That might be at a higher level for the staff admin. So we can control what what permissions the user has access to. Obviously hovering over any of these will give you information as to what actually it will do. So if I hover over the entity, see it allows me to create an entity. Once I click OK, that particular role has been created. So you can see uh, I've now created a new role. Uh, at the top, we've got the option to copy that particular role. We can edit it and we can also delete the role. So again, when you're setting up staff as from an admin perspective, uh, you may want to go through and copy this role, but slightly tweak it. Uh, if you want to do that, just click the copy option and then give it a new name. Again, it will apply to staff because we're copying the existing one. And then we can go through and apply this slightly, obviously a slightly different uh, role setting if we need to. One thing you will, you'll find you cannot delete the existing ones. There's no delete option. There is an option to save as a def or set as a default. Um, but we can delete our own ones. So very similar to most of the uh, options within the Caseware cloud, you can't delete the default that's provided by Caseware, but you can delete wider information. Uh, now, again, these, as I've already mentioned, can apply to contacts as well. So when you go through and create contacts, you can also uh, follow those same settings and same options. Now, when I've gone through and applied this, obviously, if I jump back into my staff, you can see I get the option within the staff now to go into, if I go and edit Rebecca Arfield, I can see that within the system-wide roles, I've got now a contact and staff admin role. So I can apply that to a specific user. Uh, now, the other thing that we may want to do with our staff is, is start to group them, as I mentioned already. We've already got groups, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Salisbury that we've set up previously so that we can group certain for training purposes. Um, but if I want to go into groups and set up a brand new group, again, I can go to the new option here and I can create either a new staff or contact group. Now, again, a question that we get asked, why are these? Well, why would I want to set up a contact group? 
Um, it's a good question. Um, and it's mainly res the result of if you've got a group of companies, i.e. Uh, some subsidiaries and a parent company that you may be doing the audit for, or you may be uh, using working papers to do some elements of that and you want to contact them for file requests, as we mentioned again in the first part of this webinar series. Uh, rather than going from manually assigning that user to each of the entities, you can create a group. Um, it might be, I don't know, four or five contacts you've got to put in this group that have access or so they can have access to all these different entities. Uh, so you may want to create a contact group. Uh, you can add members into them. And then you'll see in a moment how you can assign these to specific entities within the Caseway Cloud. Um, you can also assign applications, so areas that they can access as well. <clears throat> now, for now, we're going to create a new uh, staff group. So go to new and then select staff group. And we're going to call this group uh, our partners group. As I mentioned, I created uh, Rebecca as a partner. So I'm going to put her in a group with other partners uh, of the firm. Now, when I do that, I go general and then I get the options for members. So I can go through and I can add in certain members of staff that I want to be included in this group. I can search for them. I can also filter them. So I might want to filter um, group members. Well, there aren't any because I haven't added anyone at the moment. Non-group members are going to show everyone. Um, but I can go through and I can add as many group members as I want into this section. And then I can apply a system-wide role to that entire group. So where I've gone through and created my contacts and staff admin, I can go and select contacts and staff admin if I want to, and that'll apply that entire, uh, that, that system-wide role to the entire group. So again, a quick way of doing it so that you can control a group. You might have the juniors group or um, you might have the, the partners group as we've got here, and you might go, okay, we're going to create a partners um, role and we're going to assign that to this particular group. And obviously, we can, can also control the applications that they have access to. Once I've created that, I click Save, and you can see that the groups is now available on the right-hand side. Now, at the moment, I didn't assign any roles uh, to this specific group of partners. And the reason why I didn't do that is just to give you an idea of what you can, uh, what details and information you can see on the right-hand side. Um, so the group has no roles assigned. That means that at this point, they would be able to access applications, but they would all, and because we've got the all staff group, um, they'd be able to access some of the entities. But the partners themselves would not have, not have any specific entities assigned to them. Um, now, if I went through and added them as a, an entity admin, then they'd have access to the entities to be able to change them. Um, but what this will allow us to do is control the entities that the partner has access to. Now, to do that, we can go to the three lines button, or sorry, the three dots button on the right-hand side, and we can assign uh, this particular group to an entity. So I can go, actually, I want them to have access to our ABC Motor Company, AL Limited. And when I assign a role, you can see I can assign them as an owner, as an editor, as a viewer, and as an entity access. Uh, so this is where, when we're talking about the roles, we were talking about the difference between system-wide and entities uh, and the content within them. Um, the system wide will access will affect all of the entities within the case where cloud, but we can also do it on a file or an entity by entity basis just by assigning them. So if I assign them to ABC Motor Company and I set them up as, a, as an owner, you can see they can create, read, edit, delete, and also they've got basically this an owner is basically an entity admin as well. Uh, if I set them up as an editor, they can create, read, edit, and delete, but they can't do some of the admin elements. A viewer will be able to create and read, but won't be able to edit and delete. And an entity access will allow them to pretty much just read what's on there. They won't be able to, to create anything. They won't be able to edit anything. Um, if you want people to be starting uh, and working on files, you need to realistically give them at least the editor access. Um, if you just give them viewer, they'll be able to look at stuff and won't be able to change anything. So they won't be able to do any work on any files at all. But if I make them an, an owner of this and share it, you can see on the right hand side now, it's going to say that a role has been assigned to an entity. Uh, the group has roles on one entity, which is ABC Motor Company AL Limited. Those same groups obviously can apply to, to companies as well, uh, sorry, to contacts as well. Um, uh, so we've looked at staff, we've looked at um, just looking back at our agenda, we've looked at uh, staff and entities, we've had a look at roles. 
uh, sorry, we've had a look at staff roles and groups. We just need to jump quickly into the entities element of um, the case where cloud, just to give you an overview of how that works. Um, obviously, it's all well and good adding, adding the staff in, but we also need to be able to add the entities in to get that information into the case where cloud, whether it be using the SE products or whether it's just using SmartSync uh, within the case where cloud. So if we go up to our, or onto our free lines button, we go to entities. Uh, very similarly to what we saw in staff, how that we, we saved this to the end so that we can basically cover off a lot of the elements of it. Uh, but we can go to the new button and we can either create a new entity or we can import an entity. Um, there are different types of entities that we can add, a client, an other entity, an internal entity, or uh, we can obviously import each of those. Um, you can see our client UK distributor is our sales. So when, we set, when your cloud server is set up, um, your own company will be set up as an internal entity. The clients themselves will be the, 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 use, the clients whose files you'll be working on. Um, so if I go to new and I go to clients here, you can go through, and this is where we need to put in things like an entity number and a name. The benefit of this is that it will link through into working papers themselves. So if I go through and add in an entity name and add in an entity number, when I go into working papers and I um, and we go for that engagement property screen for anyone who, who is working on a uh, case of working papers on the desktop, um, those areas will be automatically populated if you've linked that file into the case where cloud. Um, but when I go to new, again, we go to clients. We need to, the minimum again to provide is a name and an NC number. So we're going to call this Elstrom Limited EL001 will be our NC number. You can also provide an operating name. Um, again, for those of you that are using the, the SE products, the operating name will feel, feed through into uh, areas of the SE products. So make sure obviously you provide that. Um, but the minimum is the name and the entity number. Other piece of information that you can include will be things like the address. Again, that can feed automatically through into some of the SE products. Um, phone numbers, social numbers, profiles, registered numbers for tax purposes. All of this can be provided if you need to and how long they've been a client for. Now, a lot of this information that you can provide, um, such as organization type, for example, you can see we've got individual sole traders, public companies. Again, they're mainly for the filtering purposes, country of incorporation, uh, company of registration. When we go to save, uh, if I wanted to, I can go and filter this information once I've created this entity. As we saw with the filters in the first webinar, that we can go through and filter them by organization type, organization, the country of incorporation. So if I just want to see my private companies, I can do that and you can see it will only pop up with Elstrom Limited. So you, the, the amount of information you provide when you're creating an entity will pretty much control um, how well and how effective the filters are within Caseware Cloud. So if you are using the filters and, and utilizing the option, then it's just something to be aware of. Um, the other thing that you can do when you create a company uh, if I go back into the new option and create, it's just you have the option to limit the company. So what that will do is that will that will can limit the people that can access this particular entity just to those that have the access rights for that entity. So, for example, staff members with admin rights would be able to access obviously every entity. Entity access and entity admin would also be able to access any entity. But other than that, only those within groups that have been set up as an owner of that entity would be able to access that. So if you want to limit the access, you can toggle this icon in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, again, if you want to, we've also mentioned you can import entities. So if you're importing your whole portfolio of entities and, and clients, and you don't want to go through and do it all one by one, you can import. Um, and again, you have uh, options to include country of incorporation, uh, organization type. So if you've got UK and Irish companies, you might want to split them up into two different imports so that it's, it's easier to control the country of registration, again, for filter purposes. Uh, but we can go to the import from CSV, entities, click next. <coughs> and once again, 
where a name matches up with a name that, of, a, of a column within case where it will automatically uh, populate. So entity number and year end month, and then we can go through if we want to and do address lines uh, and so on and so forth. So you just allocate each of the columns accordingly. Primary address city, primary address postcode. Again, the amount of information you include on that import is up to you, but then we click import and that will import the entities. There is no limit to the number of entities that you import into the case where cloud at this point. So you can import as, as, as many as, as, as few as you want to. But again, the information you provide is, is completely up to you. As I say, the benefit of doing this is that we can then assign. So we've, we've talked about assigning roles to certain uh, groups and certain staff members, uh, but we can also assign entities to those specific groups and staff members. So if I go into an entity, for example, our Elstrom Limited that we created, over here, I've got the option to click on, sorry, on the share or the edit function. We've got edit here. Um, we can share it with members of staff if we want to. So I can share it with certain members of staff from certain groups. So we've got partners, for example. So as well as controlling access rights for staff, we can, as I said, in control entities and who can access these entities, especially if we set it up as a limited uh, entity. So we're controlling specifically who can access this. We can go limited and we can just give access rights to that partners group. And then we can assign a role and make everyone within that partners group an owner of this particular entity. So if I go through this list, you can see that, that Janet Battle and, and Nicola Campbell, they can't access this entity. But my partners group and, well, mainly Rebecca Arfield, who I've added to that partners group, will have access to be able to read, edit, delete and be an admin because they are an owner of this um, particular entity. So just by being part of that group, they then have the access rights. We can share that accordingly. The final thing that you can do, uh, just in terms of entities, is apply tags to them. So again, for more for filter purposes, uh, we can tag each of the entities if we need to. Um, now, the benefit of doing that and assigning tags to entities is that we can, again, be able to filter the information between or, or, or manage the companies that people have access to. Uh, so by going to the three lines button and going down to the settings, we have the option within customization to tag manage, and we can go through and we can add new tags if we want to. So we can add entity tags, file tags, contact tags, and staff tags. If I go to entities and I add a new tag in, these tags could be things like small, so small company, medium company, large company, UK, Irish. So UK, uh, we could add another one for, for Ireland. Uh, we could add another one for... Um, small if you want to you get the general idea of we can add tags if we need to um, and then what we would be able to do if i go back into one of our entities uh, it's just going to the tags icon we can say okay so this is a uk and this is a small company again the benefit of that is that if i go back into the entities by the three lines button i would have the option to go to the filters and then again i can filter by not by type but by uh, tags so I can go by UK companies I just want to see those at UK I just want to see those that are small and again it allows you to control what you see via the filters if you apply tags to those entities um, and just quickly the padlock icon as you can see here and when I go into the um, all, all entities screen just show all the entities that we have access to I reset the uh, you see you got the padlock here Again, that will always be there any time that we have set a particular entity up as a limited entity. So because we're limiting the access within that particular entity, uh, it's just to indicate to the admin that only particular users will be able to access that. And so yeah, just to quickly recap, if I jump back into uh, the slides, Uh, so, yeah, we've gone through staff, how we can create staff, import staff, how we can assign the particular roles and assign them to, to certain groups within the Caseware cloud, uh, how we can follow that uh, by doing the same sort of thing with entities and assigning those to specific groups 
um, and how we can then control the access rights for users within that specific group. Um, if anyone has any questions at all, please feel free to drop them into the chat, but I will pass you back to my colleague Tom um, for uh, any questions and a roundup um, at this stage. Thanks, Phil. Thanks very much for the presentation there. Uh, as Phil said, you can continue to submit your questions um, into the Q&A. Uh, it's all quiet at the moment, but uh, don't be shy. If you have a question, you can use the Q&A function there in Zoom. Um, you can do that throughout the wrap up here. Um, but uh, we'll, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to, to ask uh, questions. We've got a feedback survey um, which will pop up afterwards. We'd very much appreciate you completing that survey um, to help us to um, in, in build on our future, or in, enhance our future sessions, but also you'll have an opportunity in there to uh, submit any comments or questions as well. And of course, let us know. You can always uh, get in touch afterwards if you need us to take you through anything. In terms of additional guidance, you have um, lots of guidance on the knowledge base and on YouTube, but we'll signpost those in a mo. Phil's frantically trying to find the slide that I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I'm going off piste. We go to the next slide, and first thing we're going to do is signpost our events page, which is where all of our webinars are listed, as I'm sure you all know. Um, that list is growing constantly, but that's a snapshot of uh, some of the upcoming sessions. That's caseword.co.uk forward slash events. On the next slide, um, this is just confirming where uh, the events page is if you happen to be browsing around our website, as I'm sure you do regularly. Uh, you go to resources at the top and there's events. Bit of signposting here, we'll just get this out of the way. We've got uh, our LinkedIn um, page. If you follow us on LinkedIn, that's Client Services Case Where UK Limited, then we'll notify you of upcoming sessions, any news uh, within the business. And um, YouTube, which again is Client Services Case Where UK Limited, that's where we have all of our playlists of quick vids, including the uh, webinar playlist and our recordings go on there. Recording of this session, I suspect, will be uh, on there in the next day or so and then on the next slide it's just a final signposting for kb.caseware.co.uk that's the knowledge base and that's where you'll find all of our articles again recordings of the webinar sessions any q a documents to accompany recordings of webinar sessions and um, any relevant downloads if you have access to that area of course that doesn't apply in this case being a cloud-based product so that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, take care and we'll see you on the next webinar. Cheers, guys.